today I'm going to discuss with you uh, the, the conscious mammography versus MRI, uh, which to be used in home, for home. Uh, definitely in the past few years, the volume of breast imaging modalities have grown exponentially, and thus implementing some practice has become a real uh, challenge. Uh, in general, in the field of breast imaging, the breast results are usually obtained from modalities which can combine morphology assessment together with functional information. And until recently, it was only MRI who could provide uh, both. And that's why MRI has long been considered a breakthrough in the field of breast imaging. But now having the contrast mammography in use with the same pathophysiological pathway as MRI, definitely it is now competing with MRI in uh, breast imaging. Uh, both contrast mammography and MRI are used in the assessment of breast lesions. And both modalities actually have features in common. In both modalities, we inject contrast agent to highlight areas of concern within the breast. In MRI, we uh, do a pair of pre-contrast and post-contrast images to get a subtracted image in which the area of concern is highlighted. In contrast mammography, it's not the same. We take both images in the post-contrast sequences. We take the low energy image, the high energy image. They are subtracted to get the subtraction image or the recombined image with the lesion of concern evident within a subtracted, a totally subtracted uh, parenchyma. Uh, but both techniques also have different uh, features. If we compare both, we will find that contrast mammography is less time consuming, better tolerated, with a relatively lower cost, it is easier to interpret, and we can assess microcalcifications with an equal sensitivity and a slightly higher specificity than MRI. But in spite of all these advantages of contrast mammography, we have to admit that MRI is still the gold standard in breast imaging, having the ability to do multi-sequential and multi-planar imaging. It allows better uh, lesion characterization. Uh, actually, as we have just heard that up to date, we have no sufficient data defining the appropriate indications of contrast mammography. Uh, the recommended indications include those currently approved for MRI. Uh, and the growing body of evidence supporting contrast mammographies use as an alternative to MRI in some clinical scenarios has sparked mm -hmm. controversy among uh, breast imaging radiologists and clinicians. Uh, and actually, I have chosen to, uh, uh, to do my lecture today the other way around. I'm going to answer some frequently asked questions. Whenever I give a, a, a lecture about contrast mammography, I have repeated questions. So I'm going to, uh, to uh, reverse the lecture and start by answering uh, several questions. The first question is about detection or screening. Are contrast mammography and MRI used in screening? And when are they used? Uh, in the diagnostic context, when to use contrast mammography and when to use MRI in lesion characterization. In local staging, which modality, contrast mammography or MRI is more efficient in local staging. And lastly, in the follow-up of the patients of the treated breast cancer patients, can we use contrast mammography instead of MRI uh, in the follow-up or no? And we'll start by the first question in detection or screening, are contrast mammography and MRI used or when they are used? Uh, and I usually say that in screening, we will follow the traffic lights. In general, we uh, classify the female population into the average risk individuals. And these are the individuals who have no specific risk for developing breast cancer. We have the moderate risk individuals. They have a 15 to 20 percent uh, higher incidence than the general population to develop breast cancer. And they include patients with past history of breast cancer, patients who have re removed lesions uh, from their breast. And these lesions turned out to be proliferative uh, uh, lesions of the breast, uh, benign proliferative lesions of the breast, but with a malignant potential. And all those patients who have a heterogeneously dense breast parenchyma. And lastly, we have the high-risk individuals who have an incidence of more than 20 to 25% than the general population to develop breast cancer. And these include patients with BRCA gene mutation, those who have received direct irradiation to the chest while they were uh, young, and those who have specific syndromes with genetic predispositions that predispose to the development of breast cancer. And for the average and the moderate risk individuals, we usually start screening mammography at the age of 40. 
and it might be complemented with an ultrasound examination. Uh, for the high-risk individuals and for selected moderate-risk individuals, we add MRI to the screening. And for the high-risk individuals, we start at an earlier age, starting from the age of 35 uh, years. And it is exactly here where, can, where contrast mammography can compete with MRI as a primary screening modality, because why perform two uh, studies instead of one? But actually, up to date, we have no sufficient data to, uh, yeah, to, to make us exchange the MRI with uh, contrast mammography. Uh, but uh, recently, uh, a paper was published in the radiology uh, assessing the performance of contrast mammography for screening women at an increase increased risk of breast cancer, and they have found that adding uh, contrast mammography uh, improved the screening uh, results. Uh, as we've just said, the, the use of contrast mammography in screening is still uh, debatable. Uh, it is, uh, up till now, it is used as a complementary tool in the diagnostic workup of recalled individuals from screening programs. Uh, and actually, we need more studies to validate its use as a primary screening modality, especially for individuals, as we said, of in at increased risk of developing breast cancer and in patients with a heterogeneously dense breast parenchyma. Uh, this is an example of how we use contrast mammography as a complementary tool. This was a female recalled from uh, the screening program. She had a, a small lesion in the upper outer quadrant of the left breast, and the rest of her breast parenchyma was heterogeneous with, with multiple areas uh, of uh, asymmetries. Uh, on re upon recall, she performed contrast mammography and only the lesion in the upper outer quadrant showed contrast uptake. It was biopsied and it revealed an invasive duct carcinoma. Uh, in screening, we all know that we have to compare with previous studies. This female, she had uh, a mammogram in March 2020 done uh, outside our institute. And she came in December 2020 and she said that in spite that she has recently done a mammogram, she feels something in the left upper outer quadrant. Uh, uh, and uh, actually we did uh, repeated the mammogram and there was a small cancer and the cancer which develops in between uh, the screening intervals is called an interval uh, cancer. This was her contrast mammogram. The mass showed uh, intense heterogeneous enhancement. Uh, and in, in addition to this mass, there was another uh, tiny lesion which was not seen on the contrast mammogram. And in this patient, the management of the decision changed from a conservative surgery to a mastectomy based on the multicentricity of uh, the lesion. Uh, it, a contrast mammography can be used also upon recall to exclude underlying lesions. Like in this case, we had a focal asymmetry of the right upper outer quadrant. Upon recall, the patient performed a contrast mammogram and there was no contrast corresponding contrast uptake. Uh, a targeted ultrasound examination was performed and actually this was simply focal fibroglandular tissue and the diagnosis was focal adenosis and she was put under a short-term uh, follow-up uh, study. Uh, this is a screening mammogram of a 57-year-old female. Uh, upon screening, we discovered this lower inner quadrant mass lesion and we suspected the presence of another lesion in the upper outer quadrant, but we were not sure whether this uh, was a lesion or no based on the mammogram. Uh, we uh, perform usually a single view uh, tomosynthesis for all patients in our department, and even on the tomosynthesis, we were not sure. Applying the artificial intelligence, uh, the, the suspicious uh, the place was uh, marked and uh, it, it, it gave us an indication that there was something uh, actually at the same uh, site. Uh, we biopsied uh, the lower inner quadrant lesion and it turned uh, out to be an invasive duct carcinoma and we performed a contrast mammogram and the contrast mammogram even showed more lesions than that was apparent on the mammogram and even after applying the artificial intelligence. And the diagnosis in this case was a multicentric uh, carcinoma and the patient underwent a mastectomy. Uh, this was the lower inner quadrant lesion on the complementary ultrasound. These were the upper outer quadrant lesions. And this was the pathological auxiliary lymph nodes uh, on a uh, second look ultrasound uh, performed after the contrast mammography. Uh, now we move to the second question, uh, when to perform contrast mammography and when to perform MRI in lesion characterization. 
Uh, in general, we can classify lesions uh, on contrast-based uh, studies into either non-enhancing lesions or enhancing lesions. And whenever we have non-enhancing lesions, they are most probably benign, but we also have a few malignant lesions which do not exhibit enhancement, like the low-grade DCIS, but not always, sometimes. And sometimes the enhancement of the lobular carcinoma is missed as if it is uh, an enhancing parenchyma within uh, the breast. For the enhancing lesions, they are most, uh, mostly malignant, but we also have benign lesions which show contrast uptake. And because of this overlap uh, between the benign and the malignant uh, enhancing lesions, we should follow uh, uh, specific morphology descriptors in order to be able to classify lesions into benign or malignant. And to characterize enhancing lesions on contrast mammography, because we do not still have a lexicon specific for contrast mammography, we follow the MRI lexicon of morphology descriptors, where lesions can be classified into an enhancing focus, which is a lesion which is less than five millimeter, non-space occupying, uh, enhancing mass lesions. These are three-dimensional lesions space occupying, and lastly, we have non-mass lesions, which is not a three-dimensional, it's just an area, uh, enhancing area, and it is non-space uh, occupied. Uh, to characterize foci, uh, 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 enhancing foci, we should say whether they are single or multiple, whether they are unilateral or bilateral, and we have uh, to identify their onset and uh, follow up uh, for some cases uh, whenever we are not sure whether these foci are benign or malignant. And actually enhancing foci are the most difficult to be characterized on uh, contrast studies because we can not, never describe a margin or an internal enhancement pattern for an enhancing focus. And actually an enhancing focus can either be benign or malignant. So what we can do is that we describe, as we said, the onset, the number, the intensity, and we follow up the case if we cannot uh, do a biopsy. If we have an enhancing focus, which was already present in previous studies, uh, uh, we have uh, multiple enhancing foci, which are present bilaterally. If uh, the intensity of enhancement is faint, or if uh, we follow up the enhancing focus and we find that it, uh, it decreases in size or remains stable, then most probably this enhancing focus is a benign uh, focus. But on the other hand, if we have a newly developed enhancing focus or foci, which were not present in previous studies, if they are single or unilateral, if they show intense enhancement, or if they increase in size or number on follow-up, then most probably these foci are malignant. Uh, next, we move to the mass lesions, and to characterize mass lesions, we should describe the shape, which is either rounded, oval, or irregular. We should describe the margin, which is either circumscribed, irregular, uh, speculated, and we should describe the internal enhancement uh, characteristic, which are either homogeneous, uh, dark septations, heterogeneous, and grim. And actually, going to the left side of the screen, we are mainly speaking of benign lesions, and to the right side, we are mainly speaking of malignant lesions. And we will make this more clear. We will say that if we have an enhancing mass lesion, because it might be benign and it might be malignant, then we should follow the um, MRI morphology uh, descriptors. We have to describe the shape, the margin, and the internal enhancement pattern of lesions. If we have a lesion which is either rounded or oval, with circumscribed margins showing homogeneous uh, enhancement or dark internal septations, then most probably this lesion is a benign lesion. While on the other hand, if we have an irregular uh, lesion with non-circumscribed margins, uh, either the irregular or the speculated margins, if it shows a heterogeneous enhancement or a rim enhancement pattern, then most probably this is a malignant lesion. And now we are left with the non-mass lesions. Uh, we should describe the distribution of these non-mass lesions. It might be focal, linear, segmental, regional, multiple regions, or diffuse. And we should describe the internal enhancement characteristics, which might be either homogeneous, heterogeneous, clumped, and clustered ring. And here I have to stop and tell you whenever 
you have uh, asymmetrical numb mass enhancement in one breast, which is not present in the, other, in the other breast, it should be taken seriously because it usually indicates an underlying ongoing pathology, even if it is a benign uh, pathology. Uh, we will try to apply uh, these uh, morphology descriptors on some lesions, and this is the scheme that we will follow. We will look at the breast lesions, see if it is not enhancing or enhancing. If enhancing, we will classify them into focus, mass, or non-mass, and then we will use the morphology descriptors of each of the three uh, categories to uh, reach a diagnosis, whether benign or malignant. Uh, we will start by this female patient. She is 70 years old and she had a newly developed palpable left breast mass lesion. On her mammogram, she had this indeterminate, uh, indeterminate lesion taking a ductal distribution with indeterminate microcalcifications within uh, the lesion. We asked for a biopsy, but unfortunately, the patient uh, refused. And in spite of the fact that she refused, she returned back in 2017 uh, to do another mammogram in our department. And again, she had the same lesion. It showed a stationary course. This was her tomosynthesis. It added nothing to the mammogram. It showed the same distribution and the same calcification pattern. But on the contrast mammography, there was no contrast uptake at all. And actually, uh, this non-enhancement proved the benign nature, uh, together with the stationary course, proved the benign nature of the lesion. And when we asked the patient, she said uh, that she had repeated periductal mastitis. So this was simply dilated ducts with inspissated secretions, and it was of a benign nature, based on the fact of the stationary course and the non-enhancement of uh, the lesion. Uh, this is another 45-year-old female with multiple uh, right uh, left breast palpable lesions. Actually, in her left breast, she had two uh, mass lesions. This was her contrast mammogram, and we will try together to characterize uh, these lesions. Looking at the first lesion, which is oblong shape, hyperdense, present in the retroareal uh, lesion on the contrast mammography, it did not show contrast uptake, which pro proves its benign uh, nature. The other lesion, on the other hand, showed contrast uptake. And if you want to describe this lesion, we can say it is rounded. It is non-circumscribed. It shows a homogeneous enhancement. And when we look at the descriptors, we will find that we even have more benign descriptors than the malignant. But we also have to look on other findings in the breast. We looked at, at her axillary lymph nodes and actually she had pathological axillary lymph nodes. And going back to her mammogram on the magnified view, there were micro -cal calcifications within the mass. So now the descriptors go with a malignant and not a benign uh, lesion. And actually this was an invasive duct uh, carcinoma. Uh, this was the complementary ultrasound. This, these were the pathological axillary lymph nodes. This was the malignant lesion, and even the microcalcifications are seen on the ultrasound. And this was the benign, uh, non-enhancing fibroadenoma in the left retroareal uh, region. Uh, this is another case. She had bilateral mass lesions. Uh, and looking at the lesion on the right side, we can say it is a mass. And we want to describe it. We will say it is oval in shape. It has circumscribed margins with dark internal septations, all features pointing to a benign pathology, and these dark septations are very characteristic for fibroadenomas of the breast. Well, if we look at the left-sided lesion, it's actually not a mass. It is a non-mass enhancement. It is asymmetrical. We do not see similar enhancement in the other breast. It is regional in, distribu in distribution, showing a clump pattern, all features uh, pointing to a malignant uh, pathology. And actually, this was an invasive duct carcinoma. This was the MRI of the same patient. And if we look at the right-sided lesion and the left-sided lesion, we will find that we will use the same descriptive to describe these two lesions, both in MRI and in uh, contrast uh, mammography. Uh, this is another 49-year-old female presenting with a palpable left breast lower inner quadrant mass lesion. Actually, on her mammogram, she had two confluent adjacent uh, mass lesions. Uh, if you want to describe them, we will say they are irregular, indistinct, uh, hyperdense as compared to the surrounding breast uh, parenchyma. And if we look at the co uh, contrast mammogram of the same patient, uh, unfortunately, the contrast mammogram showed an additional lesion in the retroareolar uh, region. Uh, and uh, if you want to describe the lesions, we will say they are irregular, 
They are non-circumscribed, showing heterogeneous enhancement. And this is the MRI of the same patient. And uh, we will find that to describe the lesions on the MRI, we will use the, exactly the same descriptors that we describe the lesions with on the contrast mammography. Uh, going back to the comparative table that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture, we will find that we have a very important advantage of contrast mammography over MRI, and that is its ab the ability to see microcalcifications on the low energy image. Uh, for example, I will start in this case by the contrast uh, study, because uh, if I show you the, the contrast study to many of you, maybe most of you will say it is a normal study, but maybe some of you will say, no, I have very subtle enhancement in the right breast. It might be parenchymal enhancement, but you will never be sure whether this is a lesion or no, unless you go back to the mammogram of the same patient. And when we look at the mammogram and we find that we have microcalcifications taking the same distribution as the subtle enhancement that we see on the contrast mammography, then definitely without the mammogram, the low energy images and the calcification, we would never have uh, diagnosed uh, DCIS in this patient. This was the ultrasound examination of the patient and the biopsy revealed an underlying DCIS. Again, a very important uh, advantage of contrast mammography over MRI is the higher specificity of contrast uh, mammography. Uh, many studies have been conducted to compare MRI and contrast mammography in the diagnostic context. All of these studies have reported a comparable sensitivity of both modalities, and some have even reported a higher specificity of contrast mammography. This means that if we use contrast mammography, we will have, uh, have less false positive results, and this means that we will uh, decrease the number of unnecessary uh, biopsies. And actually, a meta-analysis was conducted by Xiang Intel, and it included 13 diagnostic publications comparing contrast mammography and the MRI. And the combined results showed that the diagnostic sensitivity of contrast mammography and MRI were both high without significant difference. And that means that adding contrast mammography and MRI, we will have less false negative results, which make them both, uh, both suitable for screening programs. Uh, and the combined results also showed that the diagnostic specificity of contrast mammography was higher than MRI. And this means that using contrast mammography instead of MRI, we will have less uh, false positive uh, results. Uh, this was a screening mammogram of a 63-year-old female showing a right upper outer quadrant focal uh, asymmetry. Upon recall, we performed a contrast mammogram and actually there was no corresponding enhancement uh, to the focal asymmetry that we saw on the mammogram. Her clinician was worried, so we asked for an MRI examination, and on her MRI, there was focal fibrocystic uh, mammary changes corresponding to the same area of the asymmetry with a small hypo-intense fo uh, uh, focus uh, lesion seen adjacent to the focal fibrocystic uh, mammary changes. Uh, this was the dynamic images, and it showed segmental non-mass enhancement, and this focal uh, mass lesion also showed focal non-mass uh, enhancement. Uh, a biopsy was performed, and it came back with uh, fibrocystic mammary changes, so this was a false positive result on MRI and a true negative result on contrast mammography. Uh, this was another case. It was a screening mammogram of a 50-year-old a moderate risk individual because of her dense breast parenchyma, and she had newly developed group microcalcifications within uh, the left breast. A contrast mammogram was performed upon recall, and it showed no contrast uptake. Comparing this with the appearance on the MRI, there was uh, two adjacent areas showing focal numbness enhancement, and actually we had the impression that when we biopsy this lesion, it will turn out to be uh, DCIS. Actually, the lesion was biopsied and it was surgically removed and it revealed uh, atypical ductal hyperplasia. Uh, so again, this was a false positive result for MRI and a true negative result for contrast mammography. But in this uh, specific situation, we have to admit that for the patient's benefit, a false positive MRI was actually for the patient's benefit because atypical ductal hyperplasia is the last step before transformation into a DCIS. Uh, this is another 53-year-old female with a palpable right inframammary mass lesion. 
she had a heterogeneous dense breast parenchyma. So uh, because she had a palpable mass, we decided to do a contrast mammogram. And corresponding to the area of clinical concern, we saw subtle enhancement in the right inframammary fold. Maybe it's apparent more on the magnification views, but we could not uh, identify the actual extent or the, uh, the size of the lesion. It was uh, very difficult to be identified on contrast mammography. This was the complementary ultrasound and underlying the same area, we found some small hypoechoic lesions, uh, scattered hypoechoic lesions. A biopsy was performed and it revealed a mixed invasive ductal and lobular carcinoma. And because of this lobular differentiation, this is one uh, important thing that I want you to know, uh, we're going to discuss it a few slides later, that the lobular carcinoma it is much better elicited on the MRI than it, it is on the contrast uh, mammography. This was her MRI examination, and uh, it is evident the difference between the pattern of enhancement on MRI and on contrast mammography. On MRI, we can see that there is segmental distribution reaching to the, to the nipple areola complex, and it is much uh, showing uh, much intense enhancement uh, more than it is on the contrast uh, mammogram. Uh, actually, uh, this case is a, is a complicated case. Up till here, we have a simple case of a right breast lobular carcinoma, but this was not uh, the whole uh, story. Because when we examined the MRI of the right breast, Knowing she is a lobular carcinoma and knowing that we have an incidence of 25 to 28% of lobular carcinomas with bilateral lesions, we saw multiple enhancing foci in the contralateral breast. And she was assigned a BIRATS 4 according to the MRI findings and a biopsy was requested. Before the biopsy, we did a targeted ultrasound examination, which showed uh, corresponding multiple uh, complex uh, cystic lesions within uh, the left uh, breast. We went back to her contrast mammogram. These nodules were present, but they were showed very faint contrast uptake, and they were interpreted as part of the normal uh, breast parenchyma of the left breast. And actually a biopsy was performed and these were not malignant lesions. This was not a contralateral lobular carcinoma. They were simply UDH and papillomatosis of the right breast. And so again, this was a false positive result for MRI and a true negative result for contrast mammography. And now we have to see the other side of the story. Uh, we have uh, said many advantages of contrast mammography, but we have to know that there is no imaging modality without uh, limitations. And in lesion characterization, actually contrast mammography has some limitations. These limitations include uh, lesions in mammography hidden areas because contrast mammography is simply a mammogram, but adding to it a contrast. So lesions which, are, which can be missed on a normal mammogram can be missed also on contrast uh, mammography. In the inflammatory breast lesions and uh, contrast mammography also has uh, limitations with, the, with its use with the invasive lobular carcinoma and the Paget's uh, disease. Uh, we'll start uh, at looking uh, ab uh, at the hid mammography hidden areas. Uh, this is a right upper up outer quadrant, deeply seated lesion, which is only seen in the medial lateral oblique uh, view, and it is not seen in the CC view. We've performed the contrast mammogram and we see no difference. The lesion, the contrast mammography added uh, nothing. There is no addition of the, to the contrast mammography. A uh, biopsy was taken and revealed an invasive duct carcinoma grade uh, two. Uh, if we look at this case uh, in the contrast mammography, we can do no characterization for the lesion. We cannot assess the size of the lesion and we cannot uh, estimate the relation of the lesion with the underlying chest wall or the pectoral uh, muscle. Uh, this is another case. Uh, she had a palpable mass lesion in the upper inner quadrant of the right breast. This was her mammogram, and this was the contrast mammogram, which was interpreted as normal, in spite of the fact that on the complementary ultrasound uh, targeted to the area of clinical concern, there was a speculated uh, mass lesion, which was deeply uh, seated. Looking at her MRI, the lesion was here. It was present, but it was missed because it is. it was in one of the mammography hidden areas. It was deeply seated in the upper inner quadrant of uh, the right uh, breast. 
Uh, another uh, limitation to contrast mammography is its use with inflammatory breast lesions. And these are three different cases uh, having a global asymmetry of the left breast associated with parenchymal uh, distortions. Uh, this is the contrast mammogram of the three cases. And the three, in the three cases, we see that we have regional heterogeneous uh, numb mass enhancement, which is more or less taking a similar pattern in the three cases. But if we uh, where you know that uh, when we did the biopsy, the first case was a periductal mastitis, which can be treated by simple antibiotics and follow up. The second case was a granulomatous mastitis, which is treated with cortisone and, stero uh, and uh, uh, immunosuppressive drugs, and it is very resistant to treatment. And the last case is an actual malignant invasive duct carcinoma. Uh, actually, looking at these three cases, I usually tell them, please, whenever you have a patient that, who is presenting with inflammatory breast symptoms, do not do a contrast mammogram because it will always give you false positive uh, results. And it is better to do an MRI, and I will show you one applied example. This case, she, had, uh, she came presenting with inflammatory signs of the left breast. She had a focal asymmetry in the left upper outer quadrant. This was her contrast mammogram. The same area showed rim, in, rim uh, it was oval in shape. It showed rim enhancement pattern, and it, is, it was associated with anterior intraductal extension all signs pointing to the diagnosis of a malignant lesion. While with a simple look on her MRI, uh, this was the T2 and the uh, dynamic images, what's inside this rim enhancement was simply fl a fluid signal on the T2-weighted image, and this was simply an abscess cavity in granulomatous mastitis, and it was not a malignant lesion. Uh, the third limitation of contrast mammography is its use with uh, some uh, pathological entities, namely the invasive lobular carcinoma, the low-grade DCIS, and the Paget's disease, which is again associated with uh, intramammary uh, DCIS. Uh, this is a mammogram of a female patient in 2016, uh, and she did. Uh, she had a heterogeneous dense breast parenchyma, and based on this, she was classified as a moderate risk. And her ultrasound was also non-conclusive, so we had to perform a contrast uh, mammogram, which was in interpreted as normal. She uh, came back in 2017, but in 2017, she was uh, she was advised to perform a contrast mammogram directly, and we found that we uh, there is newly developed subtle enhancement in the left inframammary fold. A targeted ultrasound showed underlying speculated mass lesions. A biopsy was taken and revealed an invasive lobular carcinoma. And because it was an invasive lobular carcinoma, I usually recommend for an MRI that this was her MRI examination and see the difference between the contrast mammogram and the MRI. We saw more lesions and uh, more evident lesions in the left breast. And actually, this was a uh, multicentric invasive. Uh, lobular carcinoma of the left breast. Uh, this is another case. She had a Paget's disease of the left breast, which was associated with microcalcifications uh, scattered within uh, the left breast. This was her contrast mammogram. And again, the, we can say that it is more or less a normal mammogram. And maybe someone will tell me, uh, I don't, uh, yani, uh, I see a very subtle enhancement here. But uh, even if we say that this is enhancement, we cannot describe the distribution or say uh, the size of this uh, enhancement. Uh, looking on uh, the MRI of the same patients, you can, we can easily see, yes, there is an enhancing nipple, but this enhancing nipple is associated with clear segmental non-mass enhancement, uh, which describes the distribution of the associated DCIS with the Paget's uh, disease. So going back to our question to put things together, does this mean that contrast mammography can replace MRI in diagnosis? I will tell you, yes, it can replace MRI in diagnosis because it's, it is cheaper, less time consuming, easier to perform. We can assess microcalcification. Uh, uh, it, uh, there is comparable sensitivity and even a better specificity to MRI. We have less background, parenchymal enhancement, reducing the false positive results, but we have 
to uh, know our limitations that MRI is still superior whenever we have deeply seated lesions, inframammary fold lesions or axillary tail lesions, when patients present with inflammatory breast disorders, and whenever we have, we know that the patient have has one of these pathologies which are better seen on MRI, uh, and we want to, uh, to assess for the extent of the disease, then it's better to proceed to an MRI. But so long you have contrast mammography, put it as the first uh, category in your examination. Uh, moving to question three about staging, which modality to use and, uh, in, in local uh, staging. Uh, for local regional uh, staging, we must assess the size of breast lesions, the multiplicity of the lesions, the lymph node status and the attachment to the skin, nipple and chest wall. And we will see together how we can use both modalities in each of these uh, four points. Uh, we will start by assessing the, the lesion size, and we have done com uh, several comparative studies in our department, uh, uh, assessing the difference between uh, the correlation between the sizes of the lesions measured on the mammogram, contrast mammography, and MRI, and uh, in comparison to the post-operative pathology. And there was excellent correlation when using the contrast mammography and MRI with the post-operative pathology, but this was not the case with sonar mammography. And there is results were slightly higher for MRI as compared to contrast mammography, and this was mainly attributed to uh, the speculated mass lesions because on contrast mammography, there is a tendency in some of the cases to underestimate the size of the speculated mass lesion. And maybe this is one good example. This is the contrast mammogram, the mammogram and the tomosynthesis of the same patient compare the size of the lesion on the contrast mammography with its size on, on the mammogram and with its size on uh, tomosynthesis, definitely there is an underestimation of the lesion size in uh, contrast mammography. But in most of the cases, contrast mammography helps us to identify the actual tumor size. Uh, for example, this is a biopsy proven uh, left paraareolar mass lesion. We were not sure whether this was extension of the lesion or no. Look at the contrast mammogram. This is the C and the medial oblique view of the same lesion. And there is a, a related focal numb mass uh, enhancement uh, associating the mass, uh, giving us a much wider extension. This is another case with a biopsy proven left paraareolar invasive duct, uh, sorry, right paraareolar invasive duct ca uh, carcinoma grade two. And when we look at the mammogram, it's difficult to identify where the true lesion is. Where the true lesion is was not was in the upper outer quadrant of the right breast, and it was actually a multifocal malignant lesion, and it was not a single uh, lesion. Uh, this is another uh, case. She's, she's a 38-year-old female with a palpable right breast mass lesion. She was said to be a good candidate of conservative surgery. Looking at her, the contrast mammogram, a much wider extension of the lesion was seen, and the management here changed from a conservative surgery to uh, MRM. This is another case. Uh, she, uh, she had bilateral uh, uh, upper outer quadrant focal asymmetries. Uh, she gave history of uh, removing uh, uh, right breast conservative uh, surgery. Actually, looking at the contrast mammogram of this patient, the right breast lesion did not enhance or the light, right breast asymmetry did not enhance, and it was uh, simply the operative bed of the previous uh, conservative surgery. While uh, the right side, the left sided lesion showed contrast uptake, and when we take uh, see a magnified view, we will find that it it was not only a simple, a single lesion, it was a multifocal uh, mass lesions. This was the MRI of the same patient showing the same distribution and the same size of uh, the lesion. Uh, this is another case. She had a left paraareolar malignant mass lesion, which, which is evident, evidently infiltrating the nipple with consequent uh, nipple uh, dis, uh, retraction. This was the contrast mammogram of the same patient. Yes, the, the lesion showed contrast uptake, but there was an additional lesion in the upper outer quadrant of the same breast. And in this case, again, uh, the, the change from a unifocal to a multicentric carcinoma. And this was the MRI of the same patient showing a multicentric carcinoma of the left uh, breast. Uh, this is another case. She had a left retroareolar uh, mass lesion. 
uh, this was her ultrasound examination. It shows a hypoechoic retroareal uh, lesion associated with pathological axillary lymph nodes. And we can never assess the, path the pathological nodes based on the contrast mammography. This is her contrast mammogram. We do not see the axillary nodes, but we saw something additional in this case. Yes, we saw the retroareal uh, mass lesion on the left side, but there was another very tiny carcinoma present in the contralateral breast and uh, the management here changed into bilateral conservative surgery for bilateral invasive duct carcinomas. Again, in staging, we must uh, mention uh, or know our, our limitations. The limitations of contrast mammography in staging, as we've just said, that uh, whenever we have markedly speculated lesions, they are usually underestimated. We can never assess the axillary lymph node status using contrast mammography. And uh, unless uh, we have uh, the lesion uh, separate from the chest wall, and unless we have uh, the, the skin invasion, which comes tangential with the beam, uh, with the, our mammography view, we can never assess for skin uh, infiltration or chest wall infiltration. And I will show you some applied uh, examples. Uh, this is a speculated mass lesion. It is an evident malignant lesion seen in the right uh, breast. And this is the contrast mammography of the same case. If you look at the magnified uh, view and compare the size of the lesion, on the uh, mammogram and its size on the contrast mammography, definitely a wider extension is seen on the mammogram in spite of the fact that this lady, she had a very uh, heterogeneously dense uh, breast parenchyma in which it is difficult to assess the actual size of uh, the lesion. Uh, this is another case. Uh, she had a pathologically proved a right upper outer quadrant mass lesion. And this was her contrast mammogram. And on the contrast mammogram, we suspected the presence of anterior intraductal uh, extension. We decided to perform MRI and both the lesion enhancement and the anterior intraductal extension reaching to the nipple were apparent here. Uh, but we had an additional information from the MRI, in we, uh, which we did not get from the contrast mammography. And this is the amalgamated pathological axillary lymph nodes uh, in uh, level one axillary lymph nodes. Uh, this is another case. Uh, I will start by showing you the MRI of this patient. Uh, she had a malignant uh, right axillary tail mass lesion, which was infiltrating both the skin and it was also attached to the pectoral uh, fascia. If we go back to uh, the mammogram of this uh, same patient, uh, if I tell you, uh, please tell me based on the mammogram, is this lesion uh, the same size first as this, as what we see on the, uh, on the uh, MRI. Uh, it's actually definitely smaller than the size at the MRI because it is uh, a speculated mass lesion. We can never assess the attachment to the chest wall or the pectoral muscle. And because the beams do not pass tangential to the lesion, we do not, we cannot assess even the skin uh, infiltration on uh, the contrast mammography. Uh, this is another case. It's a locally advanced breast cancer. Yes, we can see a very large mass lesion in the right breast, which is attached to the nipple, causing nipple retraction. Uh, the lesion is passing uh, deeply in the breast. We do not uh, see the deep location of the lesion. And we also have a sus uh, suspected adjacent lesion, but we were not sure whether this was a lesion or no. Doing the contrast mammography, actually, the lesion enhanced. The background was subtracted, but we did not get uh, more information. While looking at the MRI of the same patient, now we can assess the rela deep relation of the mass to the pectoral muscle, and we can assess the multiplicity of the lesion. And when we chose to do a follow-up after new adjuvant therapy, definitely we did not do this follow-up using a contrast mammography. We did it with an MRI because we know from the start that contrast mammography will not give us all the in needed information. So again, can we replace uh, co uh, MRI, uh, contrast mammography can replace MRI in local staging? I will tell you because of the many advantages. Whenever you have contrast mammography, put it as your first consideration, unless you, have, uh, you want to assess for the lymph node status. And this is sometimes uh, complemented by an ultrasound examination. We can bypass the MRI, even uh, adding contrast mammography to ultrasound will give you better uh, results. 
uh, whenever we want to assess the size of speculate markedly speculated lesions, and whenever we have deeply seated lesions uh, in which we want to assess for the chest wall invasion, or we, we uh, suspect skin infiltration. And, uh, and again, in this point exactly, I will tell you that most skin infiltrations are assessed clinically uh, by the surgeons, but we have to mention them uh, in our uh, reports. Lastly, we come uh, to the fourth scenario, and that can we use contrast mammography instead of MRI in follow-up? And when we say follow-up of, uh, of the treated breast cancer patients, we mean uh, the post-operative or post-breast cancer surveillance and the follow-up of patients receiving neoadjuvant uh, therapy. We'll start by the post-operative breast. And in the post -breast, uh, breast cancer surveillance, we are usually confronted with one of three different scenarios. In scenario one, we have an immediate post-operative uh, pathology report, which comes with a positive margin. And in these cases, we usually proceed directly to more advanced imaging, uh, including MRI and contrast mammography. Uh, in scenario two, we're, uh, it's, uh, it's a patient who has been treated with, uh, for breast cancer and she is an asymptomatic survivor coming for her annual follow-up. And in these uh, individuals, we do nothing more than the, uh, the normal screening that we do for most individuals because patients with the previous history of breast cancer are moderate risk individuals and they usually follow the normal screening uh, protocol. The last scenario is a patient who has been treated for breast cancer, but she is a symptomatic survivor. She comes and says, I have a palpable mass at the operative bed. I have nipple discharge, any changes at the operative bed or in the contralateral breast. And in these cases, we usually proceed to more advanced imaging like MRI and contrast mammography. We'll start by having a look on the first scenario, which is a pathology report in the immediate post-operative uh, period coming with a positive uh, margin. Usually the post-operative breast, we find an operative bed seroma, which might show no enhancement, or it might show a, a, an operative bed seroma with a regular rim enhancement, or it might have a thick irregular rim, or we might find actu actual nodular lesions within uh, the operative bed. And going from the no enhancement to the nodular enhancement, we are actually moving uh, at an, for an increased risk of residual uh, disease. Uh, this was a 34-year-old female with history of right conservative surgery, and her pathology report uh, came with a, a full uh, with a positive uh, margin. This was her ultrasound examination. It showed an operative bed seroma, but the rest of her breast was uh, was normal. Uh, glandular parenchyma. This was her contrast mammogram, and it showed extensive operative bed uh, enhancement. Uh, actually, wider margins were, uh, uh, sorry, this patient, she performed skin sparing mastectomy, and we found residual disease in her post-operative uh, pathology. Uh, this is another case. She uh, did left conservative uh, surgery for an invasive lobular carcinoma, and it again came with a positive uh, margin. This was her contrast mammogram, and it showed subtle enhancement at the operative bed, and we were not sure whether this subtle enhancement was residual disease or no, so we decided to perform an MRI. This was the T2-weighted image, and this was the post-contrast uh, dynamic and subtraction images, and there was definite uh, evidence enhancement at the operative bed, wider uh, margins were excised and it revealed a residual uh, disease. And actually in the immediate post-operative uh, period, I usually prefer to perform MRI more than the contrast mammography because it usually gives us uh, better uh, results. Uh, now we move to the second scenario, and that is the follow-up of an asymptomatic survivor. And in this, we follow the joint ACS ASCO 2015 uh, guidelines, it, which state that for an asymptomatic breast cancer sur uh, sur uh, surveillance, uh, she should follow the normal screening uh, protocol. So uh, this was a patient who performed uh, a mammogram in 2011 after performing a conservative surgery. And this is a picture that we can normally see with skin thickening and coarsened trabeculae. This was her contrast, uh, the, this was her examination in 2012. The edema has subsided, the skin thickening has subsided and the coarse trabeculae have returned uh, to normal. But unfortunately in the operative bed, she developed this mass lesion and even without performing an additional ultrasound examination, 
uh, we know that there is a recurrence at the operative bed. This was her ultrasound examination, which revealed operative bed uh, recurrence. Uh, this was another case. She had a linear scar uh, in the left breast with a retracted uh, nipple. This was the complementary ultrasound examination, which uh, showed an underlying simple scar. And we usually uh, apply the Doppler to the to scar tissue to identify whether there is subtle recurrence or no with the, uh, at the operative bed. I will show you some uh, one example, which show you the difference between applying the Doppler. These are two operative scars. In the first case, we do not see any uh, vascularity after applying the Doppler, and this was a simple operative scar, while in the second case, there was a, a, a operative bed vascularity, which means that there is suspected recurrence, and we should biopsy uh, this operative uh, scar. Uh, this is another moderate risk individual. She had past history. She was 34 year old and she had past history of a left uh, mastectomy. She came for her uh, follow up and on the annual follow up, we found newly developed, uh, developed six o'clock micro calcifications in the left breast. They, they were not these calcifications. These are macro calcifications. They were present here and they were only seen on the magnified uh, view. This was her contrast mammogram, which showed segmental non-mass enhancement at the corresponding area. And this was the MRI of the same case, showing the same distribution of uh, enhancement. Uh, this was another case. She had uh, uh, bilateral upper outer quadrant distortions in her breast. She gives history of left conservative uh, surgery. Uh, we knew she had this uh, distortion from her previous mammograms, but the, the right, left-sided distortion was a newly developed distortion. And uh, we said, whenever we find findings in an asymptomatic patient, it is only in this case that we should proceed to further advanced imaging. And uh, this was her ultrasound. The right breast showed an operative scar and the left breast showed the hypoechoic lesion uh, underlying the area of parenchymal distortion. This way uh, we proceeded to contrast mammogram. And again, the right-sided lesion did not show contrast uptake while the left-sided lesion showed contrast uptake and it was biopsied and revealed an incidental contralateral invasive duct carcinoma. Now for the third uh, scenario, and this is the surveillance of a symptomatic survivor, and this should be taken seriously, and we should proceed to um, a more advanced imaging modality. Uh, this female patient, she had gave history of left conservative surgery, and she came with a palpable operative bed uh, to adjacent uh, nodules. We did the contrast mammogram. They did not show contrast uptake. They were simply non-specific uh, intramammary uh, lymph uh, this was another case. She had right conservative surgery and she had uh, exaggerated post-operative and post-irradiation changes of uh, inflammatory changes of the left breast. And uh, we performed MRI. And in this specific case, the MRI was, uh, yani, was uh, misguiding us. We thought that there was an operative bed recurrence with prepectoral edema and diffuse skin thickening. While looking at the contrast mammogram of the same patient, there was actually no operative bed uh, enhancing lesions, and this patient was biopsied and it revealed simple uh, inflammatory changes at the operative bed. Uh, this was another case. She had bilateral upper outer quadrant mass lesions, and she was said to be a good candidate to perform a, a conservative surgery. This was her contrast mammogram, and it uh, revealed underlying small enhancing uh, symmetrical lesions in both upper outer quadrant. When she came for her follow-up, uh, this was the appearance on the mammogram. Uh, we had bilateral upper outer quadrant, uh, apparently speculated uh, lesions, but on doing the contrast mammogram, there was no underlying enhancement. The, on the right side, she had an operative bed seroma with a thin enhancing rim. And we said that this thin enhancing rim usually indicates uh, an oper simple operative bed uh, seroma, and there was no recurrence in both uh, breasts. Uh, when it comes to mastectomy beds, the only uh, two ways that we can follow uh, or identify operative bed recurrence is either performing an MRI, and the value of MRI is to identify the relation of this recurrence with the chest wall, because as we all know, there is no uh, breast tissue left. So the first thing that the malignant mass will do is to infiltrate the chest wall. So MRI has this gives us this advantage, and ultrasound also is very beneficial in operative bed uh, recurrence. 
Uh, now we move to the last part of the lecture, and this is the post-neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, this is a 53-year-old female with a pathologically proved triple negative invasive breast cancer. And up to now, the gold standard of following up patients uh, receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy is the MRI, but actually according to several studies, and some of them are performed in uh, Bahia Hospital, we have proved that contrast mammography is equivalent in most of the cases to MRI, and it is easier and much cheaper to be used in following up uh, patients uh, under new adjuvant chemotherapy. This patient, she had a triple negative uh, breast cancer uh, and she had pathological auxiliary lymph nodes. She, uh, she had a type three uh, washout curve, uh, all features pointing to malignant nature. And we said it was a triple negative breast cancer. And for triple negative breast cancer, we expe expect an excellent response uh, when doing uh, chemotherapy. Uh, this was her, uh, after she completed the new adjuvant course, this was the MRI, uh, this was the time signal intensity curve, and if we compare the MET images in the pre-chemotherapy and the post-chemotherapy, there is a complete uh, radiological uh, response. This is another 45-year-old female uh, with a triple negative breast cancer. Again, we expect uh, this patient to respond well to the uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, we usually fix a clip within the operative, uh, within the mass lesion. We, the patient receives her new adjuvant and she comes for a preoperative assessment after receiving the chemotherapy. And we can see that there is also complete radiological response uh, of uh, the mass uh, lesion. Uh, this is another case. She had an invasive duct carcinoma, grade two. This is her MRI examination. And this was the post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy MRI, and it showed uh, a residual uh, disease. This was partial response because this was a luminal B breast cancer. It was not a triple negative breast cancer, uh, which is expected to respond, but not as good as uh, the triple negative breast cancer. This was her mammogram. And uh, after applying the artificial intelligence, we can see a residual disease. And this was the contrast mammography of the same patient showing residual uh, disease. Uh, this was another case. She also had a luminal B breast cancer. Uh, she had, uh, uh, this was her pre-neoadjuvant chemotherapy and she had an enhancing uh, segmental numb mass enhancement. Uh, after the, she completed the new adjuvant chemotherapy course, this was her ultrasound. We can never assess based on the ultrasound whether there was a residual disease or no. Uh, and even on her mammogram, we cannot assess if there is residual the residual disease or no. And even if there, is, if there is residual disease, what is the size of this residual disease? Looking at the contrast mammography, the assessment is much, much easier on the contrast mammography than it is uh, on the ultrasound or the contrast uh, or the mammogram. Uh, this was another case uh, also. Uh, she had uh, multiple lesions in the left breast. She received her new adjuvant chemotherapy. Again, she was a luminal B. She had a shrinkage of the mass, but with residual multiple nodular lesions. And this is one thing that we have to report because actually if we measure the size, the total size of these nodular lesions, we will find that the surgeon did not reduce, uh, the, the, the lesion was not reduced in size. It's, yes, it responded, but it maintained the same size as the original lesion. And this is very, uh, a very important thing for the surgeon to know whether there is a decrease in size or the, pay, or the lesion attained its original size. So the, in this case, we had shrinkage with, multi, with residual multinodular lesions. And in these cases, we measured the, the whole uh, area occupied by these uh, uh, lesions, and we mentioned this in our report for uh, the surgeon. Uh, this was another case. She had a, a left paraareolar biopsy proven uh, invasive duct carcinoma, but unfortunately, this carcinoma was within an area which showed multiple cystic lesions. All these lesions were simple uh, cysts. Uh, in her uh, baseline assessment, she did an MRI, and this was the, the only enhancing lesion. The rest were cysts. When she came for, uh, uh, for uh, her follow-up with the clinician, the clinician said, I cannot assess whether the lesion has responded or no, because what he feels clinically is the whole area and he cannot separate uh, based on the clinical examination, the mass from the surrounding cysts. If you look at the mammogram, we will find that the cysts have even increased in size. Although the mass has shrinked, the, the, the 
system increased in size. And when he felt this, he said, no, there is no response at all. So he sent us, uh, the patient to us. We preferred to do a contrast mammogram to assess for the response. And as we see here, there is excellent response. It, was, it could not be assessed clinically, but it was easily assessed on the contrast mammogram. And she came after completing her uh, new adjuvant course for a preoperative assessment, and there was complete uh, radiological response. And by this, I come to the end of my lecture, and I would like to thank you all, and sorry for giving this very long lecture.